Today I would like to revisit the issue of male suicide that I had addressed previously, though in a more methodical and planned out manner. Let me first explain what is meant by the title, The Dirty Secret That Is No Secret. By dirty secret, I simply wish to highlight the fact that the issue is largely not talked about or discussed. Conversely, by saying that it is no secret, I am providing ample evidence to show the hugely disproportionate numbers in male suicide compared to female suicide by such large organizations as the OECD, meaning that this unfortunate phenomenon is widely known, yet swept under the table to a degree that boggles the mind. Additionally, I will provide information that substantiates the claim that men suffer to a greater degree from relationship failure than women do, and that both relationship and marriage breakdown can be a probable cause for male suicide. <clears throat> Let us now begin by looking at statistics uh, produced by the OECD, this particular one which shows the suicide rates for various countries along with specific gender, specific gender breakdown of those suicide rates. Now this happens to be for the year 2006, but if you look at the OECD statistics for other years, you will find uh, little to no change, as these rates are fairly consistent, along with the deviations of male suicide from female suicide. With not a single exception, you will see that male suicide vastly outnumbers female suicide. And this alone should give us pause, and at the very least make us think about the claim that male suicide is not a problem or an issue. And this should also be sufficient evidence to make the claim that suicide is primarily, though not exclusively, a male problem. Additionally, I am providing a link of the OECD that covers teenage suicide between the years 1990 and 2009. The graph shows that whilst there is some fluctuation in the actual rate of teenage male suicides, they nonetheless hover well above those of female suicides. Now, I would like to address various articles discussing male suicide, and I'll provide links to all of them in the description box and what the react reaction and uh, perception uh, to the phenomenon is using different countries as examples. So in the first example, we see a discussion of male suicide in New Zealand, which, although located in Oceania, is generally considered to be a Western country. The article was published in 2012, and the first lines read as follows. The suicide uh, among young males in New Zealand is the highest in the OECD, according to figures released today. The article itself provides no insight into the possible causes of these high rates and merely brings them to our attention. Now, once I've gone through the various articles, I will address what I believe to be the primary cause in detail. The next article from the BBC stems from the year 2008 and calls the issue an epidemic, below an excerpt. Suicide is the second most common way for a man between the ages of 15 and 30 to die. It is outstripped only just by road deaths. <clears throat> the article does offer some insight into the phenomenon, citing the following. If suicide is the second most serious public health issue for young men, why don't we know about it? According to Jane Powell, coordinator of the Campaign Against Living Miserably, COM, the only national organization that specifically reaches out to young men at risk of suicide, it is because no one wants to know. And various ideas are then put to consideration, including psychological conditioning from an early age, such as the notion that females are encouraged to divulge their emotions, but men are not, as well as ideas pertaining to the claim that suicide is a medical issue rather than something else. And the article ends with the following statistics. With this in mind, it is worth mentioning another two statistics. Men make up 73% of people who go missing each year, and 85% of people who sleep rough. I'm not sure what that means. I assume insomnia is meant. The last article of this sort is more of a blog than anything else, and it deals with suicide in South Korea, where, oddly enough, the ratio of female to male suicide is far closer, yet despite this, females still lag behind males in suicide. Quote, one can see that the number of suicides peaks uh, at the ages of 40 to 49 for men and 30 to 39 for women. Also noticeable, uh, notable is the ratio between the male and female suicides. 
Worldwide, suicide is overwhelmingly a male phenomenon. In the OECD, male to female suicide is more than 3 to 1, or approximately 77% of all suicides. But in Korea, the number of male suicides never goes over 77%, which means Korean women are far more suicidal than average women living in comparable uh, countries and economies. Now, it might be interesting investigation of itself to know why more Korean women commit suicide than women in other countries, uh, but the numbers, once again, prove unequivocally that suicide is and remains a predominantly male phenomenon. Now, I'd like to briefly cover the correlation between relationship breakdown and potential suicide that can take place as a consequence of that breakdown. The first article is titled, Relationship Breakdown Aggravates Male Suicide, and I'll read the following passage from it. Many men respond to the breakdown of an intimate relationship by resorting to violence, that is, violence directed towards self and or to others. It is not surprising, then, that men are much more likely than women in such difficult situations to kill themselves. In this article, Ide et al., and this is an article that uh, this gentleman is referencing, uh, also be provided in the link. In this article, I lament the fact that not much is known in terms of the impact of relationship breakdown on the development of suicidal behaviors. They refer to separation as a process and the need to identify the links between the process and the critical factors for suicide. They argue that noticeably absent from the research puzzle is a solid understanding of the psychosocial context of relationship breakdown and its association to suicidal behaviors. It might be because I am reading the article early on a Sunday morning, and so my mind is even more frazzled than usual, but I was struck by how genderless this piece of work was. Sure, there is the odd mention of separated men being at greater risk of topping themselves than separated women, but not nearly enough to suggest that it is a particularly male phenomenon. It is. There is a mountain of evidence to support the tragic uh, truth that so many men crash and burn when their partner ups and leaves them, often slowly drinking themselves to death or killing themselves quickly by suicide. When I et al. call for greater uh, attention to be paid to the context-based factors that might precipitate suicide by separated persons, I say they must include specific attention to the intricacies of being a man. Quote. The article talks rather extensively about the cause and effect of male suicide response to relationship breakdown, along with a significant link on the webpage itself. The next article covers male suicide in India, specifically with regard to married men, and is titled, quite blatantly, One Married Man Commits Suicide Every Nine Minutes. The tone of this article is more or less neutral, actually. And it goes into depth on the different conditions that might be linked to the suicide rates. The following is taken from the article. The overall male-female suicide ratio of suicide victims for the year 2008 was 64 to 36, according to the latest data of the National Crime Record Bureau. The general scene is much grimmer. Now, India can't be considered, cannot be considered a Western country, and that is why I mention it, um, just to show that Suicide or marriage-related suicide is not limited to Western countries. Now, this is, should all be sufficient to set the tone and pace for what I would like to discuss and also demonstrate that male suicide, whatever its specific causes, is a significant issue. Now, one thing that's readily apparent is, despite how well-known this is to everyone looking for this information, is it best something talked about in hushed tones? in the odd back page article of some newspaper, one would think that if a specific group, say UK males up to the age of 34, had various causes of death, with suicide being the second most common cause behind uh, behind automobile collisions for them, that this would garner enough attention to be on the front page of a major newspaper, or at least a major topic of discussion in the press, given that UK males up to the age of 34, make up a rather largish chunk of the population, but we see and hear no such thing. Likewise, the case with New Zealand males, or males across the spectrum, as suicide is clearly a phenomenon practiced primarily by males across all of civilization, independent of culture, language, or any other distinguishing factors. So there would have to be some 
missing common link. Many articles and people posit the idea that men are raised in a different manner than females, in such a manner as to suffocate their emotional needs, and this is often posited as a primary cause. And I will not deny that. There's no doubt that it is a contributing factor to the problem. Other ideas are that men are simply less social, they have fewer networks and support uh, networks to aid them, which again might be, have some truth to it, but the question we all need to ask ourselves is why any of these conditions are there to begin with. And the answer is quite simply the beaten dead horse, male disposability. If a man is not but an asset, whose value is squarely tagged to his ability to be a resource to society as a whole, or to women as individuals, if a man is considered a pawn on the battlefield, whose life can be forfeit at the whim of a government and those commanding him, if a man's self-perception lies solely in his value to his female partner and what he can do for her, then he has essentially little to no value. The world sees no value in him, and he himself, by dint of his own perception of disposability and possible inutility, be it real or imagined, also sees no value in himself. A being that sees no value in himself, that is regarded as valueless by his environment, quite frankly, has very little reason to live, and is thus far more susceptible to taking his life than would, say, a creature of inherent value whose welfare is placed above all the welfare of all others, namely the female. And we see this in the discrepancy in suicide numbers. Male suicide goes far beyond issues of lack of communication and how one was raised. It goes to the very heart of what it means to be a man, which is very little at all. The little value that a man does have is still occasionally seen in the protect protector slash resource provider role that characterizes the male-female relationship which is why it is so easy to understand why so many men still cling to that paradigm with clenched and vice-like grips. Because that is all that men seem to have. Outside of that paradigm, there is no value for man, and no one has come up with a value for a man outside of it. And to buttress this claim, you need only look at the articles I have linked, wherein men's suffering as a consequence of relationship and marriage breakdown is far greater than women's suffering, which makes sense, since... The only role for a man, by all accounts, is to be in a relationship with a woman and to provide for her to the extent he can, be it a marriage or a non-marriage relationship. That is the entirety of his existence and the meaning of his existence. Is it any wonder that when relationships and marriages go south, as they inevitably do, it is men who suffer and sometimes die at their own hands? That suicide is primarily a male phenomenon is easy to understand, since the valueless will more readily part uh, with their lives than those with value, which explains the discrepancies, once again, between male and female suicide. And whilst there are many side issues, such as economic turmoil, success model, pressure, uh, issues of child rearing, all these are merely a derivative of innate male disposability, lack of value, essentially, at the end of the day. There seems to be only a small minority of men even interested in discovering male value beyond the conventional notion of useful tool, since even within the MRM it is claimed the greatest value a man can have is to be a father and have a family, all the while conceding that for many this may never come to pass and may be an impossibility, yet simultaneously offering no solutions to such men other than they should pine away in despair for something that they will never obtain. If family and fatherhood are the quintessence of male identity, what identity does the childless man have? And I believe this is the starting place of men going their own way, at least as I see it. We are starting from scratch, and as such, there will be no easy answers. We're peeling back the layers of what once was and looking for answers to what is, because we recognize that what, what once was cannot be at this current juncture in time, that only the fool willingly succumbs to an illusion he knows is such, namely an illusion. We are at the nascent stages of finding value in ourselves, and it might well be that we as individuals are the only ones to see value in ourselves as individuals, and if that is the case, so be it. I would like to think that the rejection of one's 
role as a tool and a resource will inevitably lead to a sense of value of oneself, however indefinable that value might be. If the entire weight of civilization, womankind, indeed our fellow men, cannot move us from a, an intransigent, intransigent position of regarding ourselves as something more than servants to all else but ourselves, if we remain steadfast in words and deeds, that the model we grew up with and has been with us since the dawn of time is not to our benefit, then we are taking the first real steps to combating male suicide. Because inasmuch as perceived value is an external derivative, we see the effect this has on men. If, however, perceived value becomes an internal derivative, we are likely to see the opposite effect. There are no easy answers, no silver bullet to slay the werewolf, no magic pill. After all, all the red pill did was open Neo's eyes. The rest was up to him. And given all of this, I think we are indeed making progress, day by day, bit by bit. Further progress can only be made by continuing to ask the most difficult questions, and indeed remaining aware that not all of those questions will have answers, easy answers, or any answers at all. Or perhaps more disquieting, they may not have an answer that you want to hear.